Hey, what's going on everybody? I'm Nick and I'm back with another video in this lockdown fly tying series that I just started. Um, I originally intended to get the series started yesterday. Um, I recorded the, the original video, the first video yesterday, but I had a lot of trouble getting it uploaded to YouTube. Um, so I just got it uploaded this morning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do post two videos today, yesterday's video and today's video, since I had intended on kind of trying to do a video every day. Um, so hopefully it'll just be be one a day from here on out. Um, so today we're going to be talking fly fishing for albacore tuna. And we're going to be tying up a uh, anchovy pattern that I've been using the last couple years for, for albacore. Um, this is basically a flat wing bait fish pattern. Um, I on another video or two kind of in the similar style this is using uh, different materials different colors and uh, it's finished off with a, a super cool head that I'll talk about a little later on but um, this is a very productive pattern I tie this in a bunch of different colors um, for those that don't know I run a albacore charter boat out of Westport Washington during the summer when the albacore are kind of within range um, and this pattern, uh, I always keep my, my fly rod on board and I pull it out quite often. And this pattern and one's tied in the, the different color combinations has been my, my absolute most produce, productive uh, albacore fly. Uh, I see a lot of guys tie great big six, seven, eight inch or even larger uh, patterns for albacore. And in my experience, it's not necessary. And in fact, sometimes that's counterproductive. Um, specifically for casting and retrieving flies. For trolling stuff, it's a little different story. Um, but I find more uh, smaller to medium sized patterns are, are much more productive. Uh, my outlook on that is most of what these fish are eating offshore, it's not huge. It's uh, shrimp, squid, uh, Pacific sari bait fish, uh, anchovies, a lot, of, a lot of bait fish in that, you know, three to five inch range. And this, these fish can get surprisingly selective. Um, and when they do, smaller stuff tends to be the answer. Um, they will eat big stuff when they're, when they're super aggressive. There's no doubt about that. But uh, in, in my experience, smaller stuff is, is just a better bet overall. Plus, it's a heck of a lot funner to cast. Um, so I realized that not everybody gets a chance or has had a chance to try fly fishing for albacore. It's not a super accessible fishery. Um, these fish basically during the summer they, they follow these warm water currents and they come within range of the Washington and Oregon coast and I think even into Northern California at times. Um, but this isn't a fishery that you can just wake up one day and decide to try. Um, you either need a boat capable of going 40 to 60, 70 miles offshore, um, at least out of the, the Washington ports, or you need to hop on a charter boat, which, you know, they're not cheap. Um, going rates about 425 to 450 bucks a seat. Um, but it is a super, super cool fishery. And I always say that anybody that likes to fish owes it to themselves to try albacore at least once. Um, you might get out there and decide it's not for you. You don't like being that far offshore. You don't like the ocean, whatever. Um, but everybody should see it and experience it. Um, when, when it's good, there's no fishery that I know of that can compare to a wide open albacore bite. It, it is absolute insanity. And catching them on the fly is a heck of a lot of fun. Um, I use a 12 weight rod and a fast sinking line 99% of the time. Um, you can use lighter rods, but in my opinion, it's not a lot of fun to fight these fish on lighter rods. I think a 12 weight is, is probably the minimum. Um, I wouldn't feel overgunned with a 13 or 14 weight, quite honestly. Um, the fun part about catching these fish on the fly is the grab and the first run. After that, it kind of becomes a lot of work and you need a rod with some good lifting power. So if you want to fight one for 45 minutes or an hour, you know, use an 8 weight, 9 weight, 10 weight, it can be done. But personally, give me a 12 weight or better. Um, it's just a, these fish fight straight up and down. They pull really hard. You got to work them back up and then they run back down. And it's a, it's a giant tug of war. Um, and anything lighter than a 12 and you'll just wear yourself out. So this pattern here, um, I'm tying this on an owner Akai um, two-aught hook. It's a short shank, wide gap hook. Really, really like these hooks. They're super stout, super strong, super sharp. Holy cow, be careful with these things. Um, I use other hooks too. I use these Kona Big Game Hunter 
I use uh, several varieties of A-Rex hooks and, uh, and I tie them on various sizes but these short shank 2 aught hooks are kind of my go-to. Um, you don't need an enormous hook, you need a strong hook. Um, when we live bait albacore fish we use size 1 and size 2 live bait hooks so we use a lot smaller hooks and we have no problem keeping these things on the line. Uh, but the hook is important, you don't want to use a, a light wire weak hook by any stretch. Um, so as you can see I've got about 25 or 30 wraps of 0.15 lead wire on here. Um, I'm not looking to use that to get it down to 100 feet. Um, I just like it to hit the water and start sinking and uh, with the materials in the head on here if I don't put some lead on there um, it doesn't sink super quickly um, and so it takes a takes a, just a brief second there for the line to start pulling it under and I like to hit the water and and start sinking. Again, I use a use an Airflow big game depth finder most of the time. It sinks pretty fast, so it'll get it down there. Um, you don't need to get, you know, 50, 60, 80 feet down, um, but I do like to be able to get 20 to 30 feet deep, you know, relatively quickly and kind of work it up through the through the water column. So I'm gonna get started here. Um, I've just got some Vivas white 10 aught thread. I'm using this new raid zap uh, what is this the G G4Z G something Z bobbin really really been digging on this thing uh, shout out to raid zap they actually they gave me this for free I made a big order um, from directly from them for a bunch of their UV resin and they threw one of these in there and I was super stoked because I'd kind of been eyeballing them they're really really cool bobbin um, usually I use adjustable thread tension bobbins um, like the Schman or whatever the heck that thing's called or the right bobbin or whatever um, this one's just a standard bobbin but it does have an adjustable tube you can move the just use this uh, nut here and loosen it and move it in you can actually change out the size too really really comfortable been using this the last few months super super stoked on it check it out if you get a chance uh, so I'm just gonna come in behind the lead wrap here and get my thread started so I have the lead pushed all the way up to the eye and the reason for that is when I start this fly off I tie in some bucktail and feathers and things here at the tail end and it creates a big bulky spot so by putting some lead up the front it kind of evens that whole thing out a little bit and just it's not necessary in that regard but I, I like the way that it ties and looks. Um, I'm just gonna get this lead nice and covered up with thread wraps here Oh, man, I woke up at like 2 in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, went to bed way too early and awake, so my brain's a little out of it here this morning, but hopefully everybody is uh, doing well out here in quarantine world. Everybody has their stock of toilet paper, and so I got that pretty well covered up. And uh, I'm going to start off with some white bucktail. Uh, this the bucktail here at the back kind of provides some support for the, the saddle feathers that I'm going to tie in. Um, helps keep them from fouling and just riding properly. Pull off a clump here, thin it out just a little bit. Got some wanky long ones. And this doesn't have to be super pretty. This is all kind of going to get covered up. but And then I'm going to tie it in, basically butt it up right up against the lead. And that's what I was talking about earlier, how this... I get this big lump at the back if I don't uh, do something about it. So since I need some lead on there anyway, that works out pretty well. So I'm just going to get that bucktail tied in there. And then I'm going to put in my, my first feather. That's going to be a, a white feather from a flat wing saddle. And the trick with, with tying flat wings is you really want to find the spot where the stem, uh, for the main part of the feather, the stem is really thin and round. Back at the fluffy part here, it transitions into kind of a flattish shape. Now if you try to tie this feather in flat on top of the hook at the round part of the uh, of the stem, it's going to give you all kinds of trouble. It's going to spin. It's not going to want to stay flat. So you really need to tie it in at back kind of at the fluffy part where it transitions to flat and then it's no problem. 
The problem is, if you're trying to tie a three, four, even five inch pattern, not a great big long, long pattern, it's hard to find a feather that's short enough that you can tie it in at the flat part of the stem and still get the length that you want. Like with this one, if I tied it in here, I'm looking at, you know, six inch long pattern and that's not what I'm going for. So my solution to that is when I cannot find a feather small enough, I just UV resin and glue it on there. So I'll just kind of get it to the length that I want. That looks pretty good. And I'm going to take some UV resin. This is uh, Deer Creek Fine UV resin. Uh, my favorite for this particular application is Solares Bone Dry. But unfortunately, I have developed an allergy to that. And that stuff's great because it's super, super thin. It doesn't build up a lot of bulk. Um, and that's the only problem with doing it this way is that it tends to get a little bit bulky back here when you glue the resin. Uh, hopefully I'll only have to use glue for this first feather, um, the Grizzly Saddles that I'm going to follow up with. I, I think they're the right size. So I'm going to put some resin on there, put a little bit on the feather. And this is a little bit tricky. It's not terrible. You just got to get it into position right on top. Hold it there without moving, which is the tough part. And then just shoot it with the light. And once you glue these things on there, they're on there, man. I really, when I first started trying it, doing it this way a year or two ago, I was really worried that the, the feathers were just going to shred after a couple fish. Um, but it has not been the case. I, I tied these flies for sea run cutthroat, a time for salmon. Um, and they, they're durable as I'll get out. In fact, last summer during the albacore season, I fished a same version of this just in chartreuse and white. And God, I don't even know how many fish I caught on that fly. In fact, I still have it sitting on my desk. Still, the hook's all rusty and dull and everything, but it's uh, perfectly fine as far as the durability. So I do some thread wraps just to, just to make sure that's good and locked down. And then I'm going to go with some flash. Now between each feather, I'm doing a total of three feathers here for the tail. And between each feather, I put a little bit of flash of a different color, different variety. Um, first off, I'm using some, this is just like a pearl uh, polar flash. And I'm not going to make this super flashy. Um, I don't want to go too crazy. Uh, just a little bit. And I want it to be pretty close to the length of the, of the feather. And I want to make sure that I don't just cut the ends all flush. I want them different lengths so that they, when this is moving in the water, if you've ever seen a flat wing move, they move extremely well. Um, this isn't really a, a traditional flat wing style, but it's, it's still got the flat wing tail and it moves. And I really want each piece of flash to kind of move individually. And if they're all cut the same length flush, it doesn't really work. So I'm just going to get that and I'm going to tie that in right there on top. And then I'm going to go with my first, it's just a grizzly saddle hackle here. Um, get that kind of measured out for length. And I'm going to basically just get this tied in at whatever point of the hook shank allows me to, to tie it in at the flat part of the stem and still get the length that I want. I want the feathers all about the same length. And I'm going to start with a loose wrap. Couple, couple loose wraps, make sure it's in the position that I want, and then I'm going to start tightening it down. This really helps make sure that that feather doesn't spin around on you. But until I really figured out about how the stems work, um, I saw it in a video or something. Man, I was pulling my hair out trying to tie these flies and get that feather to lay flat. Just trim off a little bit of that fluffiness. You don't really got to go worry about this being super pretty because this is going to get all covered up anyway. Uh, but just for the sake of working with it, uh, trimming it up a little bit. I'm sure that my camera is going to cut out here at some point. So I'll have to do a little editing when that happens. I think there's a time limit on, on how long this will run. Okay, and then I'm going to add a little bit more flash. This is a crystal flash. It's sort of a, I can't remember what this is called. It's called like herring back or something like that. Um, 
it's just sort of a, a dark black and silver. Um, I don't know. I just like the way it looks. It provides a little, little bit of contrasting flash. Um, anchovies have some some darker spots on them, so uh, I just think it looks cool. And I've only got about uh, what six, seven strands in here. Again, I'm not not going too crazy. Um, we fish live anchovies. Um, I run a charter boat for all rivers and saltwater charters, and our specialty is fishing live anchovies for albacore. Um, so I'm always trying to come up with flies that mimic anchovies because, man, albacore love them. And uh, this one works pretty, pretty well. So I've got that flash. Now I'm going to put my other saddle feather this grizzly saddle on there again just a loose wrap or two kind of hold it in place a little bit while I wrap back just making sure that that feather is nice and flat if you haven't seen a, a flat wing move in the water uh, I know there's some videos around some underwater footage and man they move so well uh, they just those hackle feathers kind of flutter and undulate and they're pretty pretty awesome and again this is not your typical traditional flat wing but I like it okay so for my last flash on top of that second grizzly flat on grizzly saddle I'm going with some ripple ice fiber in holographic silver I love, love, love Ripple Ice Fiber. I use a ton of it. I have every color they make. I have backups of every color they make. It's, it's just fantastic stuff. Um, the colors are super cool. I really like this holographic silver. Again, I'm not going crazy with a ton of flash. I just want it to sparkle You're out there in that clear blue water. You know, these just a little bit of sparkle can be enough to catch a fish's attention from a little ways off. Albacore have great big eyeballs. They can see a long, long way in that clear, clear blue water. That water is blue out there. You get, get a certain f distance offshore. There's not a specific distance, but that water clears up and starts turning blue, and that's really what we're looking for. Um, that and, and, and certain things with temperature. Um, but that, that water is clear basically because there's a lack of life in it. There's no plankton or anything um, and that water, that warmer water, that stuff can't survive. So uh, that water is super, super blue and that's where you're going to find the albacore a lot of the times. Um, it's general rule of thumb because they will come in into cooler, greener water at times. All right, so I've got the tail end of that tied in. Now I'm going to put in some flat diamond braid. And uh, this is just sort of a little bit of a shiny, flashy underbody. Honestly, this is as I tie this pattern, this isn't even really necessary. It's barely visible, um, but I do it anyway just because it, it's habit and it looks cool. So I'll just wrap that body up a little ways. I'm not going super far because I got to leave room for tying everything else in here. As I said in the, the first video, uh, I'm going to try to do, do one of these videos every day. Um, it's a good time to, to crank out some content for people. Um, so if there is something that you'd like to see, please leave me a comment. Let me know. If I can, I will get to it. Absolutely. I, I will, I'll run out of content ideas at some point. So if anybody has any thoughts. So next up is going to be some gray bucktail. Um, again, I'm going for the, alb or the anchovy look here. Um, I would do it in different colors if I was going that route. Uh, chartreuse and white is one of my, my favorites. Of course, it's hard to go wrong with chartreuse in the salt water especially. So I'm going to take a fairly thick clump of this. Um, you don't want to go too thick, but you don't want to go too thin either. Um, it's a fine line with this one. Usually I always say sparse is better with bucktail, and that's that's still true here, but I, I want it to be full enough to kind of fill out this fly. 
and I'm going to line it up. I don't want it to go all the way back to the tail. I want it to go, you know, three quarters, maybe a little more. Kind of helps with the, the bait fish profile. If I go too short, then the tail gets really thin. It looks too long and goofy. If I go all the way back, I don't really get the taper that I want. So you just got to kind of play with it. I'm just going to tie that in up near the, the front here. And I'm going to kind of use my thumb to flay it out a little bit, flatten it a little bit around the hook almost. Um, looks pretty good. And then I'm going to flip that upside down and grab some more of my, my white bucktail. And uh, I'm going to kind of put some more white in there for the belly. Um, there's white kind of at the back end, but uh, in this one I'm going to go pretty thin, pretty sparse. I don't don't need a ton of material. Um, I just want that nice white belly, and I'm going to tie this shorter. You know, I already have white bucktail there. I'm going to tie it maybe halfway down the original white bucktail, um, just so the underside of this fly is white. As we know, most bait fish have a light colored belly and uh, it's really amazing to me how selective albacore can be um, my first it took me a while to get my first albacore on the fly they were in a selective period and I had to go smaller and smaller and and more subtle and different colors before I finally found a fly that they would eat um, so there's times that, you, that, that these fish are so hungry and so aggressive that you wouldn't even hardly want to reach your hand in the water for fear that they would come take a bite out of it. But other times, man, they're as selective as any Spring Creek trout, I'm here to tell you. So I do like to be as, uh, you know, as close to what I'm replicating as possible. So I pulled that bucktail kind of around the, the hook shank, and now I'm going to take some, uh, oh, I believe this is minnow belly. UV minnow belly probably I don't remember this is just on a it's on one of those zip ties and I do not have the package but just kind of a, a supple thin pearl flash I uh, just like to put a little flash over the top of this bucktail what do I got going on there it's not not totally necessary I don't always do it but it looks cool and as we all know, tying flies is as much for the fishermen as it is for the fish, so I like the way it looks. And I cut this really long because I like to uh, I like to just take my scissors and cut this, trim it at various lengths. Um, same concept as the flash I spoke about earlier, where I want the I want the flash to be different lengths so it kind of moves, sparkles individually. And then do the same thing and pull that around the hook come back on top and I'm gonna go with some more ripple ice fiber this is smolt blue my absolute favorite color of this stuff this color is just freaking fantastic I put this in damn near all of my my saltwater flies and I'm not gonna go with a ton of this um, just enough to where I want I want just a hint of blue in there uh, to my eye, anchovies, oftentimes these Pacific anchovies that we see, they uh, they have just a hint of blue. Um, so just thin this out. There we go. And I'm going to tie this in on top of the gray bucktail, not quite as long as the bucktail probably. It doesn't really matter, but that's how I like it. And I just just want a hint of blue. Then more ripple ice fiber. Shocking. This is a gray minnow. This is really cool stuff. This is like a fairly darkish gray, but it's got it's got some sparkle to it, uh, which I I like this stuff, and it makes a nice kind of a darker back to this fly. Um, 
anchovies have a have a dark back, a whitish belly, and then they get some some flash. They got like a flashy kind of lateral line. And I'm going to tie this in a little bit longer than the than the blue. I want the the gray back to kind of go back and blend in with everything. I just think it looks looks better that way. Again, tie that right in on top. Kind of flatten it out, spread it out just a little bit. Just so it doesn't look completely, I don't know, narrow and Okay, that looks pretty good. And then the last material that I'm going to use here is some of this lateral scale. Um, really, really like this stuff. It's just, it's pretty hard to beat for doing a lateral line. And, and like I said, anchovies do have that kind of flashy lateral line going down the side. So I will put in a piece, tie in a piece on each side here. Can't really see what I'm doing, but. get that tied in and what I like to do is then fold it over do a couple wraps just to help it get nice and durable then I'm gonna do the same thing on this side all right as predicted my camera shut off so I had to fix that so I'm just doing the same thing with this size lateral line fold it over for durability you can see that nice shiny piece of lateral line flash on each side and then I'm just going to kind of clean up the head a little bit doesn't really matter here because I'm going to cover it up do a whip finish and this is the, the coolest part of the fly here I finish this fly with a head from spawn fly fish uh, shout out to the spawn boys my friend Josh owns that company. Super cool guy, local company. Really can't say enough good things about them. They, they have a whole f online fly shop, basically, with tons and tons of great materials, especially for, for local Northwest saltwater fly fishing. But they, they ship around the world. But their, their bread and butter, what they started with, is these heads. They make these, uh, these plastic, they're like a rigid, hard plastic head, and they come in all different shapes and sizes and colors with eyes, no eyes. They come in white, so you can paint them yourself. They come in translucent. Um, they're super, super cool. Really, really like these things. I have a ton of them. Um, great customer service. Just, I cannot say enough good things about that. this company. Um, they're based out of the Olympia area here in Washington. Check them out if you haven't. Um, but these heads, these heads are really, really cool. So I'm going to put this on, I'm going to glue it on basically, uh, similar to like a fish mask. Uh, I'm using some uh, liquid fusion glue and I'm going to just put a little, work it around the head of this fly, not a ton. I don't want to make a giant mess out of this and I often do, uh, but I do want this head to be good and secure. Okay, well my camera has decided that it really wants to be a pain. Uh, so as I was saying here, I put a little more liquid fusion on here. And then I like to put a little bit inside the head itself. Um, I find that when you put it on there, when it's just kind of dabbed on the, on the head of the fly, when you push the head on, it kind of just pushes a lot of that glue back. Um, so putting some inside the head seems to help. Um, I should mention that I pre-drill out these heads because the hole at the front isn't quite big enough to get on get across this these big hooks. Um, so I just take a drill and pre-drill it. It's no big deal. Um, just get that slid on there. Got a bunch of glue. Here's a little trick for if you have glue in the eye of your hook. You can just take a stem of a feather, marabou or whatever you got, and just run it through there, and it'll clean it right up for you and then make sure that that head is straight on there looks good and that's it like I said this is this is not a terribly hard fly to tie a little bit some a couple little tricks to it like getting those feathers on there is basically the hardest most time-consuming part um, 
super, super productive fly. Um, I tie these for sea run cutthroat. If it wasn't for this enormous stout hook, I could fish this fly for sea run cutthroat. This is only, oh, three and a half, four inches total length. Just about what I like. I like about that four inch mark. Um, I, I literally fish this exact same pattern for sea runs and salmon very productively. So it's certainly not just for albacore. There's a million fish out there that would eat this. Um, really, really good fly. Really, really productive. Uh, that's it. Um, add, you know, give this give this one a shot. Add a few to your box uh, if they work for you for any species. Love to hear about it. Um, as I said, if anybody has any any content ideas, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, I'll just kind of keep cranking these out as best I can. Hopefully, provide some a little bit of entertainment and maybe some ideas for people while we're sitting at home. I'm sure like. Most of us, you have lots of ice time right now, so I uh, hope everybody is uh, doing well out there, and uh, thanks for watching.